Hello, and welcome to episode number 369 of the Armin Show podcast. People, science, creativity, learning more, whether it's philosophy, psychology, economics. We're always trying to expand our knowledge base. Subscribe if you haven't on YouTube, Spotify, or wherever it might be. Support the show as it continues to build in different ways. On this one here, we have the author of this book that I have on the left of me, Free Market, The History of an Idea. It is Professor Jacob Soule of USC. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Armin. Great to be here. I'm glad to have you on. You are a university professor and professor of philosophy, history, and accounting at USC, uh, Dornsife. Your work examines the mechanics of politics, statecraft, and economics by dissecting the various elements of how modern states and political systems succeed and fail. What led you into this category in the first place? Why not physics? <laughs> I mean, I've always just been interested in, you know, how states succeed and fail. We're always talking about this. There seems to be these almost facile prescriptions that people give, like, oh, if we just do this, everything will work. And so my work has always been to go into the archives and look at states in the past because we have all their, let's just say their DNA is all sitting there. All the material is sitting in the archives and you can go through and you can dig and you can find what was important or what was essential to states um, and to economies and to other things. And often the things that I found have not necessarily been what we think. So in my last book, I found that in all these states that were created, accounting was really important. Um, then in this book, um, as I, I worked a lot with uh, the Greek debt crisis and I worked with some major finance people. And every time we did something economically and every time we did something that was successful, it was a remarkable partnership between both private industry, but we needed the state at all, all, at all times, whether that was to make a good reform or for somebody to make money, the state was there in one way or another. And I began to actually literally go around to the business leaders that I was working with and I would ask them, do you believe in free markets? And they mostly would laugh. This was behind closed doors. Um, and they would l actually laugh out loud. And, and I just, you know, that's not what I'm doing. I take free markets very seriously. And I spent eight years writing a book about the topic. But what I realized is that it was just this idea that you could say, oh, just let's get the state out of it and it'll work. I'm, that works for certain businesses to like lower taxes and regulations. But it doesn't actually work as a global idea. I couldn't find any evidence so I had these certain people saying, ah, just get the state out of it. And then I would look at the evidence and I'd say, that's not exactly how this is going to work. And doing a giant financial project like the Greek debt crisis, I found out that it turns out we need states and we need private industries and we need interaction that's really smart. And that kind of inspired the book. Mm -hmm. I noticed that theme there that you cannot remove the state or the idea that if we just clear that out, that would solve issues. It seems a little bit smaller minded because it developed for some reason and has some applicability for some reason, maybe in a limited context, right? But to say the binary cleared that out doesn't also have a follow up solution as well, sort of like we'll remove that and things will just be resolved. Right. Exactly. Good to go. You know, there's sorry, there's just this story I was talking to a major industrialist once. A lot of this comes from my talks with sort of major business leaders. And I kept sort of being surprised. And I said, why did you move the business to China? Um, and it wasn't because of cheap wages. It wasn't because of a lack of regulations. It was because the state built an airport, roads, and a port This is for a Fortune 500 industrial manufacturing co company. And I was, I was really surprised. I was like, that's why you moved to China, because the state built infrastructure. And they were in a southern state, and they had gone to very important politicians, and they said, we need an airport, we need a road, and we need a port, and this is a huge business. And they just laughed. They said, we're not going to get the state involved with all this. And so they took this major company, and they moved it to China. And it wasn't for the reasons that you would think. And I thought, that is really – I mean, this is one of the reasons I wrote the book. I said, this is amazing. So this sort of talk of why companies move manufacturing to China was often because of – not stupid state support, but because of building infrastructure, the kind that you know we are, I believe, lacking in the United States in many cases. So um, 
I don't know, it just became, I'm for free markets, I'm for personal freedom, I'm for economic freedom, but I just don't, I think it's lazy and I think it's misleading to once again, just as you said, this sort of simple binary doesn't really work because the world's really complex. And as I went back into history, I kept finding that complexity. And that's sort of what the book's about. Your example there says a lot with China because there's an illusion. People do this when describing other individuals or countries or companies that sometimes you'll go there because things are less than and then there's some great opportunity in that. But we don't do that in any case. We go because there is feature one, two, and three that are good things that are usually not mentioned in many categories. They're like not mentioned even in relationships between people. Those are left out, and then the negatives are described as, oh, I'm pulled towards that. But nobody's pulled towards a lack of something or an emptiness or right. a corrupt center. You're pulled towards maybe there's facilities for something to build off of. There's an opportunity there to work off of. You need a foundation to latch onto in some way. Right. If that, I mean, this is, again, one of the, so one of the theses, one of the main ideas of this book is that the idea that you, that an economy would work on its own, just on its own, with no help from anything, is relatively recent. And one of the things I wanted to say is that there are all these people who talked about free markets in the 16th and 17th and 18th centuries. But when they talked about them, they talked really clearly about the state being front and center in the free market. And these were the people that built the modern economies. And I thought that was really important. So they've never been considered free market thinkers, for example, Alexander Hamilton. Um, but they are. They're the people that actually said, look, we want free markets and we want a market to, to we want market mechanisms to work, supply and demand and other things. But for that, we're gonna have to have this industrial economic strategy and the state's gonna be involved. And I and I was like, wow, these guys, what they describe. In, in that period sounds a lot more like what we still have today rather than what I would say this kind of utopian idea that it's called general equilibrium, that if we just walk away completely from the market, it'll just work on its own. People have said to me, oh, that's a straw man. Nobody thinks that. But, you know, you see what's happening in England today. People do think that. I mean, this is one of the richest countries in the world. It's gone into absolute turmoil. Its markets are, you know, in semi-collapse. Because people believe that if you literally just cut taxes enormously, it would just produce growth. And it turns out to be more complicated than that. This is a larger theme. I always take things to larger themes. There's nothing in life that you leave it to be and it builds towards something, let's say, with lower entropy or something that's functional for your grouping or a larger group that doesn't already exist. It might be good for trees that are already out there, let's say it's something in nature, but as far as us, there's no natural phenomenon that automatically uh, gives itself to our building. And it's very complex, the things that we do as people. It's not like a simple item to support businesses and get people moving in a certain direction. And the idea that you could just leave it to random chance and it would be wonderfully supportive is not functional. Right. I mean, this is the idea between, you know, these, these tax cuts in Britain, which are still going ahead and the markets are nearing collapse again. I mean, their pension funds, their mortgage funds, their bond markets. I mean, these are not small things. I, if this goes on another few days, England is, is crippled. And there was, a, and what the criticisms they said is you've treated this as a giant casino, these tax cuts, and then the cost of these tax cuts, and then the, the spending cuts are so enormous there's no strategy around them. By the way, I have a friend who's a, a well-known conservative um, financial columnist at the London Times, and he wrote, and he said, this isn't how it's done. When you want to spur on industry, you have to have targeted tax cuts because you actually have a strategy. If you just throw it out there, scattershot, often it all just goes into sort of often not necessarily the most efficient place like these hedge funds that are now hedging against the pound, and lo and behold, those guys are very close to the people in government who have done these policies. And it's all kind of, as you, as you met, as you said, it was just random and that's not necessarily, you can get lucky, but that's gambling. Um, and we see with big nation states, we can't always figure out how things are going to work out, but you can incentivize things in a smart way. And sometimes it works a lot of times it works and sometimes it doesn't, but that is, 
seems to be the way that works better overall. Hmm. One thing I used to do and I still do mentally is, I'm curious about this. I like to take things and make them into a small grouping. So I like to imagine 100 people early on in history and, okay, we have a job to do. Eventually, some are going to be better at doing the job or managing others to do the job, uh, start to lead the pack. Okay, you guys need to do this. It'll start to have some sort of structure and whatnot. And then the idea to just clear out the top crew or any sorts of delineations that don't actually take into account that we have different specializations seems to have not worked in any way. What are your thoughts on that? Like a hundred people idea. Wait, sorry. Repeat that again for me. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Right. So like, what what would you think about that idea of looking at it? Like just a hundred people needing to live on earth and uh, how they would end up with specializations and uh, group leading uh, a couple of individuals, maybe leading the pack and others needing those and having to remove the leaders be like missing the concept of how it already developed. I mean, Naturally. One of the things we see in society that um, what we see now in the modern economy is that the most productive people right now we're seeing are the brain people. They're not always the loudest. They're not always the physically strongest. So if you put people into a pack on a planet, you'd get these sort of super strong, aggressive people who would take over, possibly wipe out the nerds, right? I mean, the nerds wouldn't make it. <laughs> it turns out what we find, and I don't think this is just the modern economy. I mean... When you study history, the brains are producing wealth a lot of the time, but they're not the most aggressive people. And we see in societies that can't promote and facilitate the brains moving forward, you don't see productivity, you don't see creativity, you don't see the kind of wealth. It takes a lot of wealth and a lot of planning, a lot of care to get these complex societies with complex economies. And if you look back to the 16th century, I look back to Golden Age Holland, for example, which is the richest place in the world for hundreds of years. And Holland has had the longest Gini, high Gini living standard factor of any place on earth. And people are saying, why, why? And I'm like, it's really easy, just super high literacy, civic peace and tolerance. And then the state actually works really closely. We didn't used to think that the state was so involved with the economy in Holland. We're finding out that the state and the private companies were working together like this the whole time. But they were also promoting lots and lots and lots of smart people. And they had a huge, very rich university network. Um, and a huge um, accounting school network. A huge Latin school network. So super high literacy, tolerance, the promotion of the brains and the nerds. This isn't today's modern um, information economy. This is, you know, 1580 or 1520 economy. It was working the same way. Hmm. Yeah, you cannot discount that it follows the same criteria whether then or now. And speaking of history, actually, which is covered quite a bit, you went all the way back to the uh, 13th century uh, leading up to today. How or what led you to go so far back and then who are some key thinkers that come to mind from then forward? Well, I, mean, I, I mean, I go back to ancient Rome because of Cicero. And Cicero comes to mind because he is the first person to come up with an idea that if you set a kind of ideal kind of exchange, things will work on its own. His idea of a perfect exchange was between two aristocratic senators who would make a, a, a financial or economic exchange not based on greed, but based on love and friendship. And it's very idealistic. It might not be true, but this was the first time that someone says, look, if two people who are friends and respect each other and who speak to each other at a high level get together and they make an exchange, that exchange will be good and it will then cause a kind of virtuous circle of wealth. And what I found is when I went back through all these economic thinkers, many of them what we would call free market thinkers, or I would call early free market thinkers, Cicero was always there, at least until the, the 1850s. There was always an idea that there had to be a kind of virtuousness in the exchange. And then there gets to be this idea that greed is good and vices can be virtues. But most of the time, there was this idea that if the market, a market was going to work on its own, it needed this 
huge kind of virtuous framework based on friendship, based on kinship, based on all these different ideas of ethics. And so Cicero sort of stands out. And one of the things I find interesting is Adam Smith was a professor of Ciceronian Stoic philosophy. And I was startled that no histories of free market thought had ever examined, a, a few have examined his Ciceronian thought, but they hadn't examined it as a history going all the way back. And so I just went all the way back looking at Cicero and economic thought, and he was there the whole time. And he produces both what I think is to be, is, is a good, interesting idea about ethics, but he also produces a sort of utopian idea that if we just find this ingredient of exchange, it'll just work on its own. So he's a really key player. I am sort of idealistic. So I am in that framework of thinking similar to Cicero. And the more recent elements are not as appealing to me because the first one is like building something as a team, let's say. And then the more recent thinking is it'll still work. That will drop to a foundation of business and business, and it doesn't need a virtuous nature attached. The, it'll function fine without that. It was never necessary in the first place. Is there anything unappealing to you about the more recent uh, form? I was, I was actually talking to a friend who's in the oil business about, because he said, look, you know, I don't want to hear about all these attacks on the oil business. I said, look, we need oil. I, I get that. I also get that it's very destructive at the same time. So what do we do about that? And I said, you know, there are these big oil companies that I don't respect because not only have they lied about the effects of oil, not only do they create pollution and not pay for it and clean it up, um, but they didn't invest in renewable energies. So just letting those guys work, and by the way, they've been heavily subsidized by the government too. So, And, you know, the fact is, is that America right now, you and I are having a nice afternoon in Europe, they're going to run out of oil because they didn't invest in these things and they don't have the same um, fuel capacity that we do. And we can't run on renewables yet. I mean, we, we could if we spent more money, I think, do better. But my point with him was that, look, we, we, we really gave free reign to American oil companies. They have gotten us fuel that we need, but I don't think they're smart companies. I don't think the market worked out for them. Because if anything, they tried to undermine investment into renewables. And, and I was like, how is that smart? And for the first time, I actually saw his eyebrows go up um, because he is an investor and he's investing in all this new technology. And I said, those are stupid companies. They're companies that, that not only didn't invest in the future, but undermined future investment into new technology. And they were market driven. They were given every incentive now, the government was heavily involved, and people could say, well, that was the problem. Had they just been free to compete? And I said, well, the problem is it just doesn't seem to ever work that way. These companies got enormous power in government. They had you know, representatives um, from the oil industry who were presidents of the United States, and they looked after their interests. So we have to be a little bit realistic. There's no such thing as the government not being involved. Big business always gets the government involved. At that point, we get these oil companies doing things we need, but also being really dumb and destructive at the same time. So I don't think if, I think there are certain cases if you're just left alone, for example, university research. I think if you get really good people, you give them funding and you kind of leave them alone to a certain extent, they will go and do the research that's kind of necessary. But we're also seeing that, you know, we need research into certain things. And so suddenly governments, government funders and universities spin around this happened in Silicon Valley where the military went in for all this radio technology after the war, spent all this money, huge amounts of money, the CIA, um, the Department of Defense, huge amounts of money. They then created Silicon Valley, and then the venture capitalists came in later. <laughs> but this happened where you had all these researchers. The state decided we need certain things done. This was an industrial military strategy. The state came in and started paying for it, a lot of it through Stanford. So they were working with a private institution that then created this market for technology that venture capitalists could come invest in. The idea that you're just going to have venture capitalists and nothing else, this is what the British, new British government says, we just need to get rid of all government so venture capitalists can do what they do. Well, history shows that that is not at all how it works. 
me the foundation of, I would put things into the category difficulty, challenge, necessity for the moment, sense of urgency, yeah, uh, a push from leadership. Yeah. Without those things, you can't have the nice elements at the top of uh, comfortability or venture capitalists uh, in their communications or cities that pull people towards them. That comes after the fact. It's like a lagging indicator of uh, necessary efforts and uh, tough decisions. I mean, if you look, if you compare British, the history of British shipping and the history of the chip industry, they look a lot alike. That there is one country that sort of gets out ahead, often through ingenuity, but also the government backing up the the initial business. Then you get another country. Let's just say, um, in the in the case of of British shi of shipping, it starts out with Holland being the leader, and the English say we are we're going to have to be a maritime trading colonial nation. That's their strategy, for better or for worse. That's their strategy, and they realize that if they can't compete with, with the Dutch shipping um, merchant marine or its navy. It's just too advanced. So they make these rules to protect their ports and their boats from the Dutch, that the Dutch can't bring their boats into British ports, they can't have their men on British ships, that it has to be a kind of national industry. What well, works? <laughs> it works. They build up this national strategic industry that then partially dominates the world, for better or for worse. I mean, if you look at, for example, the history of the chip industry in the United States, it's all government strategic, and then it's based on venture capital. So what we're seeing today with American incentives now being given by the government for the chip industry to develop again follows a long history of the chip industry being started by the government and then followed up with, with private, private um, entrepreneurialism and investment. And so I just think it's misleading constantly, for example, by the British government to say, we just need venture capitalists. I'm like, that's not how it's going to work. And by the way, you're not going to get venture capitalists. You're going to get hedge funds hedging on all your failing, on your bond market, on your real estate market. You're just going to get vultured out of competition. That's what they're going to do to themselves in England. What England needs are these kinds of really, really high-end technologies because it's a relatively small country compared to the big players now. And so you need to think more like South Korea and Taiwan. And if you look at those countries too, in almost every case, there was a large balance between government strategy, investment, subsidies, and then, and then entrepreneurial capitalism mixed in with that. I once spoke with... Jeffrey Kane, he had a book called Samsung Rising about how Samsung was connected to South Korea so yeah. directly. Cool. And the impact that that has. Can you speak on that and some countries where the government is quite intertwined with business and the impact that that can have for uh, getting things done maybe more quickly or with more force? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a mixed bag. It can fail. I mean, picking winners and losers, that is, I think, really dangerous. When you have a strategy saying we need this sector to function – we're going to give, for example, tax incentives. By the way, Elon Musk is a, is a welfare baby. He's gotten more than, I don't know, $16 billion in loans and funds from various governments. I think Texas just gave him a $500 million incentive to come to Texas. By the way, he makes no money from sales. He makes his money from rebates from the government. Now, I've had a lot of people say, but he's doing all this stuff that's useful for the United States. I said, okay, fine. But when he comes out with a libertarian discourse, it's extremely misleading and unhelpful. It helps him because he's already been subsidized. He's now trying to keep other people from being, get the kind of startup money that the government gave him to go. I mean, South Korea is really interesting. I mean, my book doesn't really cover a lot of modern stuff, but I've since been researching it a lot. South Korea did a huge investment into, for example, chemicals, into heavy industry production. Um, this was a long time ago, and they realized, I mean, South Korea had been basically destroyed. They had to build these industries. So the government came in working with private industry strategically to create these huge, serious industries, which gave South Korea this massive base so that it could be a serious industrialized country. Then Japan paid a huge amount of reparations to Korea, which also helped them invest in these industries. So you just see this huge government investment that now you can't see, you know, after 
50 years, you can't see it. Now you see all the entrepreneurialism that's working on top of all the investment that happened um, with states um, making strategic investments. Um, you know, I was really interested in um, Taiwan because Taiwan has n doesn't seem to have a huge amount of state interaction, but the state made a huge strategy that helped private companies develop, for example, its chip and other technological uh, industries, which are incredibly successful. I mean, Taiwan has 25 million people. It's constantly blockaded by China and remains technologically one of the leaders of the world. I mean, that's really unusual. And so I looked in and I was like really interested, you know, how much state is in there? And there's not a huge amount of state, but the state is always there. The state is educating people. It's making strategies about who to send away to American universities. It's really, really interesting how it works. And a lot of the states that seem to have, let's say, not a, a, an evident huge footprint, invest a huge amount in research and educating people. That's another way you can get a, a huge payback is R&D. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we see, by the way, California, people are always dissing California. Well, California is the home of venture capital on planet Earth. It's also the home of R&D. And guess what? What does R&D mean? It actually means huge investments in higher education. So California public schools are not as good as they should be, but the, the university system is overall probably per capita the best in the world for higher ed and then for research. I am still bullish on California with all of its problems because UCLA, Berkeley, um, Irvine, San Diego, San Francisco, Riverside, Santa Barbara. I mean, the, the list goes San Jose, the list goes on and on. These are all world-class institutions run by the state sucking brains and they don't have legacies. They don't have lacrosse players. They're just going for the brains. And the state is paying professors real salaries, bringing them in from all over the world. I work at a private university, but we work a lot with the public universities. So California is a sort of huge center of brain investment. So all these other problems we might have, my sense is this brain investment is what pays off again and again and again. I thought about that before. It's like a powerhouse system that does not exist in some other state in that way. It's so substantial. Many institutions, and then there's also the private ones, and they connect with them. It's very nice in California. It, it, remember, future. we have – this country has – I mean this country <laughs> – sorry, the state of California. <laughs> um, sorry about that. When you're here, it begins to feel like a country. It has, what, 37 million people. That's basically around half of Britain's, Britain's population. Our GDP is a bit bigger. Um, I think we spend five, something like, we have five times more venture capital. And if you look at our spending on R&D, the way it's measured, I tried, I was writing an article about this and, and the measures are different because some measures are state, state spending on pure research and others include higher ed. So it's very hard to compare. But I think we spend an enormous amount more than Britain and we're half the size. And so if you want to have a serious conversation about why California is so competitive, you need to look at the state investment and there's federal investment goes into that too. You need to then look at what attracts companies to spend so much in California, given the fact that it's the most highly taxed and regulated state that you can find. And the fact is, is yeah, it would feel like California could use with less ta with with less tax. It's, it does drive people away. At the same time, why does it work so well? People often ask the wrong questions. So why does a state that has all this taxation and all this regulation work so well? Well, it turns out it's complicated. But I don't think that that Texas is going to fully replace California because California is more tolerant. And it is more engaged with, it has a much bigger higher ed and research sector. And I think that with all these other problems over and over again, tolerance, openness, attracting brains, what it needs is affordable housing so that more brains will want to live here because brains often don't want a lot of material goods. They just want to do their thing. They want decent salaries, but lots of people in the brain industry, that's my industry, 
take salaries that people in private companies would laugh at. And a lot of these people are the smartest people in the world. They could work for any private company. They choose to work in the brain industry because they get to use their brains. Um, and California allows you to do that. The pay is good enough. The housing seems to be one of the biggest issues. Anyway, this is, so this is the interesting thing. If you were in England to say, what would spur England's economy? I would say R&D spending and housing for brains and then visas for brains. Because England still has one of the best public university research systems in the world, but the pay is terrible and the housing is expensive. And I get letters all the time from colleagues in England saying, can you get me a job? at your university. And I'm like, I can't, it's not that easy. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I mean, think right. about that for a minute. I mean, so you have these guys in England saying, we've got this strategy where we're just going to cut taxes for bankers and it's going to spur the economy. Ah, it's not that, it's not that easy. By the way, if I were to give a strategy right now for California, it would be huge amounts of affordable housing, A, for lots of people from other states but also within the university structures for the brains that come and work here. Because we want to attract all these brains and then the brains are going to produce, produce wealth. We know that the intelligence, the, this is the economy that's producing the most wealth right now. Not necessarily the most jobs because it's not manufacturing, but if you mix that with a manufacturing strategy, you had the brains and the technology and the on-ground manufacturing, that could possibly produce jobs too. It's, com it's complicated. I like that you look at regions such as California or Taiwan almost like businesses in a way as far as their efficiency, like a smaller amount of something leading to a larger amount of results is something to look at because you can't ignore when there's a quality there. Somebody else will lose. You can never outcompete quality with... Uh, you can push for quantity, but there's something there that is accurate to follow up on. And then also you look at the assets that it has, and an area or region has certain assets that you cannot counter, maybe location, maybe weather, geography, the pull. I like that you look at it sort of like what a business would need to thrive in a way. I mean, this is my this is my thing is that you will get business people saying, we need less government, less taxes, less regulations. And then they'll go into a place like California and spend all their R&D and all their venture capital. And I'm like, that they want lower taxes for themselves. They want less regulations for themselves. But their investment strategies, you see Texas definitely does, is, you know, a powerhouse and it's attracting a lot of businesses. But a lot of those businesses got off the ground somewhere else. Um, and so, for example, Tesla, I find it insulting and ridiculous that he's moved from California, which subsidized him completely. Um, and Texas is now subsidizing him too. People don't know about this. Um, Musk. Um, but, uh, yeah, I just, I, when anyone comes and talks like that, I'm like, they're not that serious or they're not being truthful. The, the fact of the matter is, is there's no question that lower taxes and lower regulations can help businesses but that's just not how it works in its totality. And so um, also management, um, California could be way better managed. Um, one of the things we discovered with the Greek debt crisis is that investors like well-managed states. Uh, and so it's not just the regulation and the, ta the taxes, it's the fact that the state is well-managed. For example, in Greece, we discovered that if Greece, the country of Greece had better accounting standards, there would be more confidence in the country altogether from its lenders and from investors as well. This means that, and by the way, in order to get those accounting standards, the state needs to invest a lot of money into training people. Getting a really good public financial management system in a state is one of the biggest historical challenges we see over and over again. So the idea of state management, the state just managing its own goods well, that's what my next book is actually going to be about, is, um, is, is absolutely key. And once again, if you say we don't want government, that doesn't actually seem productive at all to me. So yeah, I'm really opposed to that statement. And I, people say it's a straw man. It's not a straw man. I hear it all the time. What I'd really like to hear people say realistically is we need really smart strategies and we need to be aware of all the pitfalls in these strategies that can 
allow government and business to produce sustainable long-term wealth. Two themes you mentioned there. One, the idea of pulling the ladder out from beneath you, like you described with Elon Musk. I'm never a fan of that. When you do use a strategy, it works for you, and then right. uh, you move to the next step, and then you talk about how that strategy is not functional. It's kind of like when immigrants move to a country, and then 10 years later, they're like, oh, these immigrants are coming in. But wait a minute. That was just 10 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> This is actually, this is also, this is one of the driving ideas of the book too, yeah. So what's a free market? I mean, what is a free market? A free market involves a lot of personal freedom and it also involves a free government that is an ideally a smart government that we don't always have, right? Um, and people say, there's no such thing as a smart government. I'm like, yeah, there actually is. That's called, you know, for what... And, it has a lot of problems, but, you know, Singapore is smart. China was smart for a long time. I'm not sure it's being smart now. Um, America, I mean, when the American government goes in to create Silicon Valley, is it being dumb or smart? It looks like it was a really smart move. <laughs> I mean, America right now is literally, you know, it's, it's got the leading companies in the world. They came out of Silicon Valley. That came out of the American federal government strategy. <laughs> so I'm like, so what's a free market? A free market over and over again seems to be the, the really smart symbiosis of government and private industry. That is my thesis in the book. And therefore, when we talk about free markets, I'm like, we need to redefine what that means so we can have an intelligent discussion about it. And um, so, you know, I've had people saying, well, I'm against, you know, Trump's tariffs and Biden hasn't lifted the tariffs. And I'm like, we need to see if those tariffs are productive or not. Um, if you do see American um, manufacturing has been gutted in the Midwest, the Northern Midwest, for example, um, is do tariffs help that or harm it? It looks like to me they might be harming it. Um, it's very complicated. That's the thing is that if you just give this kind of blanket answer to things, it doesn't work. Every successful investor I know, and I've worked really closely with People are phenomenally successful. They say it takes me years of research to, to start one of these huge investments that are successful. So that means a blanket statement is not how to make an intelligent investment. And that's why I hope that this book leads to more intelligent conversations showing historically over and over again in, in, the, in the very distant past, often 500 years ago, that the people who built states that are still rich today did so with a strategy that was openly about governments and free markets. It doesn't mean big government. It doesn't mean government all the time. It means smart industrial strategy. On that idea of the blanket statement, is it reasonable to say that more often blanket statements are made in the not that direction or I am against that or we should remove that versus what there seems to be a theme of, of going towards something or what is your proposition or taking an idea or government building up a framework, something there versus going away from. Is there something to that theme? Boy, see, that's smart. Um, yeah, it's often a very, ne it's a very negative argument. And the problem is if you want to make the positive arguments, a lot more work. Um, and so I think that just so much of our um, discourse is... Well, you know, the thing about free markets in there, if you look at orthodox free markets, they say, we're always going to get there. We haven't gotten there yet because people have interfered or, you know, you should talk about Reagan and Thatcher that did liberalizations and some of them were good and some of them were disastrous. And they said, well, the ones that didn't work, it didn't work because other people interfered and we couldn't get there. There's always this future we're not, there's a negative and then a future we haven't gotten to instead of it saying, wait a minute, having this kind of complex conversation saying, it's not, if we want to get somewhere, it might take a strategy that's very specific to the time and place. And that's a much more complicated and politically fraught statement to make. It's much easier to say, we need to remove this stuff. And the reason it hasn't worked in the past, the reason we've never had a, a full ideal free market, because that's one of the free market statements is, well, um, Reagan and Thatcher almost got there, but they were thwarted. Well, they weren't thwarted. They actually... Thatcher's free market policies led to mass unemployment and to crazy inflation and to chaos. And 
Some of them helped Britain and a lot of them did not help Britain. Reagan took out huge amounts of government debt for military spending. By the way, that might have been his most successful move in some ways because it led to huge amounts of (laughs) R&D. I'm just saying like, so the simplified, we need to stop this doesn't seem to work to me. I do think that, yeah, you need this kind of more positive strategic statement. The problem is politically, it's much harder to do. People want a kind of negative positive. Like if we just did this, everything would work better. We just have this simple recipe. And what we're seeing in England for the first time, in Britain for the first time, is, Here's this, what I found. is that's not working. Over and over again, that's not working. And so, and now you have conservatives saying, that's not working. We need, a, we need a, an actual strategy. So I don't know if that answers your question, but um, I believe that free markets, oh, there's another thing. Over and over again, we see these wealthy countries, people are always talking about Singapore, and we have to take into account China. Why did it have the greatest economic growth moment in human history? Well, the state, some people argue that they just let entrepreneurs run loose. That's just not true. They did in certain areas, but the state was there. The state has these huge, huge sovereign wealth funds that they use to invest vast amounts of money. There are state-controlled companies moving towards things. So they had this moment of success. Um, But the other thing we see over and over again is investment in education, investment in research and Singapore. So this idea of divestment or, for example, having good health care really helps very wealthy, productive countries such as Scandinavian countries, which have cut back on certain spending but still have spending on healthcare and things like this. They have healthy, educated populations that are incredibly productive. So could America be more productive? Absolutely. Um, What do we need to get there? Well, it's going to be complicated, and I don't think it's a one-size-fits-all. By the way, it might be very useful to have a super deregulated Texas and a highly regulated California. Um, What I'd be interested to see if all these companies that have moved from California to Texas, once they were subsidized and created out of this Californian pocket of wealth creation, will we see really big companies that are founded in Texas, that that are founded zero the last 40 years in Texas before moving to another state? Because Texas, as you'll see, as it gets richer, will end up having more laws and regulations and other things like that if it survives. Anyway, I don't know. I just think that it's, um, I think these blanket statements and I think the concept of just a total free market has not been helpful. I think a sophisticated approach to what a free market is and can be might be more what we need. I like the idea there. I have a visual that comes with this, even with that, the Texas companies having their foundation from their original California individuals that went there, sort of like a pyramid and... Uh, if you do not have the bottom of the pyramid, it's nice to talk about the top of it, which is the most noticeable and the highest and the coolest part and interesting. <laughs> but right. without the bottom portions of this pyramid, you don't get there. And so to talk about, like, if we just got rid of the bottom of the pyramid or these sections, this is the part we really care about, the, the view up here. But right. it would not be up there for it would fall in some way. There's a foundational nature that I think you're describing that we cannot leave out or ignore. You know, we've got, I've got a lot of students who are educated in California and get their start here, and they move to Texas because housing and personal taxes. So I do think California needs a strategy to hold on to these people. I think that is absolutely an issue. But um, it has been a very rare thing. By the way, there are phenomenal universities in Texas, but there aren't that many of them, okay? I mean, considering it's a huge place, it has a tiny fraction of the R&D and the educational framework that um, that California has. It is very rare that I meet, and I work with lots of companies and lots of governments, that I meet people who are like, we got our start in Texas, or I got my education in Texas. I'm always meeting Californians that move somewhere else, and they're like, we couldn't take all the taxes and whatever. I'm like, that's why you went to school there. So I do think that I, maybe this helps the country work. I don't know. And I do think, I'm not saying California is perfect, and I know it needs a lot of reform and it needs um, a lot of work, but it's also a place that we might say is an older, sophisticated co- economy while Texas is just getting off the ground. 
And I do think in the future, you're going to see more taxes and regulation in Texas. And you might actually see people not necessarily sticking around there. I don't know. We don't know how it's going to work out. I do know from the chart that the money is still flowing into California and we're still getting innovation here. And I believe that it's just because there are so many smart people here that are young. And by the way, a lot of my students are saying for reasons of tolerance, they don't want to leave. So some are saying, I want to get out because I don't want to pay individual taxes. Um, I, I am seeing that too, but I'm also saying, seeing people like, I want to live here because it's tolerant and, and that's like, I don't know, that's very interesting. Historically, that's also been a marker of wealth creation is um, tolerance. So, and also mm -hmm. religious tolerance and all sorts of different kinds of tolerances so that people feel comfortable and free. Um, I don't know, we'll see. It's all very interesting. We'll see how it works out. Um, I'm still bullish on California. This is a place that has no real public transportation, has no water. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's just hard for me to always understand how it works. It still seems to be working. And I still get letters from people saying, can I have a job? Can you help me get a job in California? And I think that's interesting. This is slightly a tangent, but it just came to my mind when you described that, the water and the issues of California. Uh, specifically, Los Angeles, I've thought about this, but just a very specific question. Would you have ever, if you would rebuild Los Angeles right now, would you have built the tallest buildings by the ocean and then smaller going away from the ocean, kind of like Chicago, sort of like that versus what it is right now? I mean, I, I don't know if I would be building tall buildings in an earthquake zone. I just, oh, yeah. I don't like them. <laughs> um, by the way, I wouldn't build tall, tall buildings near the ocean now because with global warming, we're going to have a lot more tropical storms and hurricanes and that coast is gonna get battered. Um, we already, I mean, that's something that's gonna happen. The Mediterranean's already seeing that. Um, I will say this, anyone that knows Los Angeles knows that the has these huge kind of boulevard streets with separators, and then those separators used to be tramways. The word Dodger is also um, comes from uh, the idea of dodging tramways. So it's, this was a tramway city. USC was built with a tramway fortune. There used to be really good public transport here. Um, what we have now is a city that was built with public transport and the public transport was removed. If we had super fast tramways going everywhere, um, and there have been plans and plans that they've been thwarted again, um, and actual industries have gotten involved to get rid of these because California is a center of driving, um, I think the city would just be amazing and would change on its own very, very quickly. Um, and also, if you had tramways that could get you to other places, we would start seeing more capacity for affordable housing and other things like that. I do think that public transportation, when you go to Europe and you go to these huge cities in Europe and you're able to get around really easily, I mean, London's a giant agglomeration. The transportation system's not always ideal, but it works much better than here. It's unbelievable. The space you can cover in the London area, which is London's huge, and people live super far out and they zip in and out with a transportation system that has loads of problems, but it is functional. And no, you don't actually need a car in London. You just don't need a car. Um, I, I do think that would be transformative. And then there'd be that sort of market element of once that state investment would made, made the market would start doing things on its own, perhaps in a more positive way. Um, and remember, people did not foresee global warming. So that's also going to be an issue of how that's going to work. Um, that's not my area of expertise, but um, you're going to see people asking for things from the states, like in Florida, people didn't want any state regulations. And now they found that their entire areas are not livable. And there won't be any insurance for that. And actually, I don't know what those areas of Florida are going to do. So regulation can be really important because people will not always invest rationally. All, people buying houses on coasts, building entire cities on coasts that are going to be underwater or are now gone. Like Fort Myers is gone. It looked like it was newt. I mean, what's going to happen to Fort Myers? <laughs> and like regulations might have helped that city survive. So that's, you know... Can the market do that? 
Maybe, doesn't look like it has so far. So what's a free market? Again, we're back to that question. It's very complicated. Mm -hmm. My past guest, Rebecca, was in Sarasota, so they got near there, damaged in the Florida and a lot of changes there. In the world right now, where would you say are some of the hubs of where government and business is functioning great, it's very active, and you would want to be there? This is where movement and changes are happening. It's not stagnant and functional. I mean, it is functional. I mean, it's super complicated, and um, I, mean, I think we know the places. I mean, until recently, China was a place where it was happening. Now, with Xi becoming di a full-on dictator, I'm not sure it's going to work so well. <laughs> and if you look at the history of China, it was a mixture of spurring incredible entrepreneurialism and state involvement. By the way, one thing also people don't seem to understand is that one reason people in China and India work so hard, and I'm naming a few countries, is because they they're have really low living standards. Um, the, the Prime Minister of England and her Chancellor have called um, England a country of idlers and lazy. Well, one of the things that happens is people work hard so they can become wealthy and have um, a uh, society in which they don't have to work themselves to death. <laughs> so that is a problem that industrialized wealthy societies face is that people have worked really hard to get the wealth and once they have it, they don't wanna kill themselves and work that hard. But you do see places, for example, here in California, I see people working incredibly hard you know, look at the wealthy places in the United States. I think it's like an interesting mix. Um, you see wealth creation centers across the West Coast. Um, you see them in the Northeast. The, the sort of richest places in the country are parts of California and then Massachusetts. Um, Texas, um, Florida's getting, once again, you're seeing these new places where wealth is moving. Will there be wealth creation there? Possibly, we'll see what happens and, and how it evolves. Um, but I do think what you see is places with great investment in higher education, in pointed industrial strategy. Singapore is this sort of big success story. Um, we have to remember that the biggest part of the Singaporean economy is still the state. The state owns, in fact, most of its successful companies like Temasek Holdings, which then holds Singapore Airlines, which is a state-run company. Um, the most successful airline in the world um, is, is state owned. Go figure that. Um, so I, the places that you go, first of all, they're moving very quickly and a lot of them are fragile. I would even say I would call Texas fragile. It doesn't have um, a long-term history of industrial wealth production. So we'll see what happens. Florida also does not have this long-term history. California has been at the center of a very long wealth production, Massachusetts. Um, there are these European states that look fragile. Take Britain, for example. Um, Britain had a lot of opportunity. I feel like it keeps shooting itself in the foot. There's just no question, though, that these countries that are enormous and have been overlooked or have been poor for a long time, like India, are up and coming. But so, for example, I'm not very bullish on Brazil. People have been really bullish on Brazil because they, use, they have an extraction economy. Um, I'm more bullish on India because India has all this brain economy going on. So it might be chaotic, it might be crazy, it might be semi-feudal, <laughs> but it's like got all these brains there again. So my sense is follow the brains. And that's, you're going to see extraction economies, they don't have long-term viabilities and they don't seem to distribute wealth well. They seem to lead to destruction and social problems. Um, and in richer countries like America, um, extraction industries have also been a sort of mixed bag. They are necessary, um, but they bring a mixed bag of wealth and destruction. Um, I say follow the brains. I really do. Right now, that seems to be where the wealth is. Um, so, and a lot of that is, is constantly reforming itself in the United States. So I am curious to see how places like Charlotte, North Carolina, North Carolina is no longer considered a democracy. Will it become a democracy again? Will, will it continue to grow? Will it continue, it, you know, it's based around this hub of universities, this brain hub. That's where their wealth came from. Um, by the way, Texas, when you bring brains in, they're usually coming into places like Austin and Dallas, which have these amazing universities in them. I would look at these hubs of universities 
around the world and who's investing in them. And I think there you're going to see economic wealth creation. You made me think of something when you described India and the poorer countries and how I've always thought that difficulty in that way or kind of cold, rainy, when I think of Scotland and Adam Smith and David Hume, places that are more challenging to be in, so much great comes from those, much of the great thinking versus where it's, let's say, very warm and tropical is not as inspiring to a general person to come up with great solutions because well, I mean, too much comfort in a way. I don't know. I mean, those are also places that have massive civilizations and great cultures in the past. So I think that that's also, I think that the, 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 the rise of, first of all, the, capitalism was invented in Italy um, and Italy was a warm place and it has been a warm places where it came out of were partially warm. I don't know if that stuff totally completely works. Um, mm -hmm. I do think that now with global warming, hotter places are going to get harder. <laughs> That's the one thing that they're going to get harder. But, you know, India has had massive super civilizations and it's had them in very warm zones. Um, you'll see all across Southeast Asia, there were super civilizations for huge periods of time in there in Africa and South and Central America, super civilizations, the industrial revolution happens in very a few places for very particular reasons that allows a few countries to dominate the world. Those countries no longer dominate the world. France and, and Britain no longer dominate the world. Um, in fact, they're, you know, in retreat in a lot of ways. Um, you know, when we talk about freedom and free markets, one of the things that seems to work really well for me is actual, and this gets back to a hot topic, is immigration and emigration and visas. And one of the things we saw in the American explosion of wealth was not only a massive investment in higher education, but a huge number of immigrants coming in and those immigrants having contact to um, higher ed and having contact, having possibilities for super education. Um, it seems to me that the countries that will let brains move in freely, but also give people a chance right now, America has a, it has an immigration crisis, which is absolutely real. It's really impossible to have huge numbers of really poor people just showing up in one region without some kind of, um, you know, without some kind of plan. And we've been struggling with that, but it's not a struggle that's going to be easy because we've got these hugely poor areas to the south of us and massive borders. It's going to be very hard to ever control those borders from what I've seen historically. But we have labor shortages. And one of the things you see again and again is that immigrants work incredibly hard. And I see this in my students and are incredibly, they work under incredible conditions. I have students who are first generation coming um, from really tough circumstances where they're going to university, an elite university like USC, while supporting their parents during COVID because their parents lost their jobs. Being, they're just working under startling conditions. You want people to work hard, get immigrants over and over again and give them educational opportunities. You will see remarkable things happen. I still believe in that American model. Lots of people don't. Um, but I think you'll see where places are allowing people in, where there are visas. Some of them are strategic to bring in brains. Others are just allowing people in to come in and work and giving them good educations. You will see growth there, educations and social mobility. Um, that seems to be part of America's great success or up until recently. On the topic of immigration, actually, how much of it would you say is wanting to get away from one's own region and problems? How much of it is wanting to go towards something uh, described as opportunity? And how much of it might be like marketing to make a place look more fruitful than it might be? I mean, you know, there's this idea of the American dream, which really I talk about in my book, um, goes back to, actually goes back really to the 15th century, but it's really in the 18th century that it becomes an economic model that there's this place with untapped and kind of unlimited wealth. And it becomes a dream that you can, that that will drive the market. If you can tap the wealth, and I have a whole chapter about this, this idea that if you just tap into American wealth, the market would just drive itself because there'd be eternal wealth coming from America. Um, 
I still think that people want to come to America. What's interesting is that I meet immigrants who say I've gotten here and it's been amazing. And I meet others that are like, I want to go home. You know, this isn't what I banked for. It's too violent. It's too crazy. It's, um, it's, it's intolerant. I see lots of people from Asia actually going back to Asian countries like Taiwan, for example, huge numbers of Taiwanese people, um, uh, educated in America are going back to Taiwan where there's less economic opportunity, but it's a peaceful society that's actually very sweet and nice. And that's what they like. There's no violence in Taiwan, no guns, no violence. I mean, for now, unless the Chinese invade. Um, uh, I think it's very, very important to keep that idea of a dream alive. It's very interesting. If you come to the top universities in, in California, you're going to find so many foreigners in the top spots. Um, during the Trump administration, a lot of people left and went home. And that was bad for us. But there's still a lot of people here. Uh, and so I don't know if people, for example, in the old days, you'd get states like Iowa filled with famous foreign professors. I sincerely doubt now, and I'll say this openly, with abortion laws and a lack of tolerance and a lack of investment in higher education, that you're going to get famous foreign professors moving to the state of Iowa. The University of Iowa, for example, where I went as an undergraduate, was once a place filled with world-class departments. It is not anymore. So there are parts of the country in which you're no longer going to get that, and that America will totally lose out by that. Over and over again, it's been these brain immigrants or just immigrants who have come to a place where they were attracted to by a dream and that that dream kind of paid off in a lot of ways and they were tolerated. Um, I think now it's a mixed bag. I still think that as things get tougher in the developing world and in, as you say, the hotter world with global warming, there will be more migration pressure. We already know that. So it's going to be a double thing. Um, it's going to be very hard to manage. But one of the things we see is that to a certain extent, um, the great immigration wave that America had at the turn of the century, of the last century, produced enormous wealth and possibility. And um, I still think that's a, a model. And what there needs to be for those people is education and possibility and then higher education. That's where you start to see incredible wealth being created. If you want to look at the people, by the way, remember American higher ed used to be dominated by wasps and you know, wealthy Germans that had come as immigrants fleeing you know, unstable or, or intolerant political situations. I mean, Einstein didn't come here for fun. <laughs> you know, he, fled, he fled a really tough situation. He didn't end up in Princeton for fun. So America through tolerance and these other things has attracted the best brains in the world, which has allowed us to do these incredible things. I still think it focuses around tolerance and education. That is what my historical research shows me. And if you want to talk about free markets, it, I do think a certain amount of freedom of movement, freedom of thought and giving people educations and then the possibilities to build um, businesses and work in government and do all these things at the same time will give you incredible opportunities. One thing I, you know, if you look at Poland, for example, it's a super interesting place. Poland has been one of the centers of growth in Europe because they have super work ethic because they had been really poor. They had been a satellite, um, col brutal colony of the Soviet Union. They finally got free. They work really hard um, because they have a, a generally good education standard. Lots of small tech companies come. So Poland has been a kind of, motor of economic growth in Europe. But when you go to Poland, there are no foreigners. They have a zero immigration policy. And you feel the stagnation already. I don't see Poland as being incredibly dynamic because there are no non-Polish people there. And so this country has become less democratic, less tolerant. And, you know, it's not going to be a place where young uh you know, vibrant minds are going to be running to Poland. It's not going to be the case. And so do I think Poland has a great future? Not with the government and the course that it has now? No. Um, did it have this kind of moment of growth? Sure. But to build on that over and over and over again, we see that um, that's why I think Western Europe actually could have a lot of possibility because it still has all these um, research institutions, 
The problem is the places are tired, people are underpaid, they do, they do not allow foreign brains to come in on their super hierarchical, so then you have bad government, too much government involvement in education, not enough private public education, not enough investment in public education. These things are complicated. But if you compare California to European states, you see over and over again what Europe could be doing better. So my bullish on California back again, as far as free markets go, yes, do I think there needs to be more opening of markets in California? Possibly yes, too. Um, so we need more traditional free markets, maybe less tax and more possibilities for people to build um, businesses, absolutely. And then we still need all this state investment into the things that work. So it's very complicated. Once again, free markets work, but they're complicated. Simplistic free markets don't seem to exist. And that's the message of my book over and over again. But I go back deep into history to show that over and over again, this is how it works, that, that we, there is like a model that works over time. I like that you looked at the big picture in describing it over a long period of time, what has worked, because some things have worked for periods of time. I have two last questions for you. One is, who are any thinkers that have guided your thinking the most? Do any people come to mind in that category? I mean, look, I, it's not a cheap answer, and I didn't cover him enough in my book. It's Alexander Hamilton. God, that guy's brilliant. I mean, pff, it's really crazy. His project on manufacturers from 1791 is one of the most brilliant economic texts. And I didn't make it clear enough because it's actually an anti-free market text. The people around Hamilton would later called free market thought British imperialism because Britain was so developed by the end of the 18th century compared to America. America didn't even have a currency. Britain by the end of the 18th century has already developed high-tech manufacturing. I mean, it's actually got serious manufacturing going on, modern manufacturing by the end of the 18th century. America can't compete with that. You know, the project for manufacturing, Hamilton says, is look, we cannot have open borders. We can't have free markets. However, it's really smart. He said, if we tax foreign goods too much, it will cause shortages and it will cause problems with supply and demand. And so what we need is these really pointed tariffs on foreign goods so that we don't get inundated. Then what we need to do is take the money from those tariffs and, in, and, and use them to help local industry develop so that we can compete in the future. And it's just like, and that's how America gets off the ground. It is a really brilliant text. And I think a lot of it's actually written in response to Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, where Adam Smith, by the way, talks about the need for the state to, he, he, he recognizes that the British state created the conditions for freer markets and for economic growth in Britain. But Smith sees the British Empire as a free trade zone. So it's not countries just general free trade. No, he says if Britain takes over the world, it can create this free trade market. And what Hamilton says is that that doesn't work for an undeveloped economy like America. America used to be a developing economy. He said this developing economy is going to need protection and it's going to need subsidies, but really, really smart, pointed ones that do not stop international trade and supply and demand. You want to read a smart economic text that still works today in lots of contexts, and that's very clear, as opposed to Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, which most people really can't understand. It's really, really hard to understand the book. I would say read, um, read uh, Alexander Hamilton. It really is an extraordinary book. And there are reasons that America took off. And one of them is, is that during the period that Hamilton and Henry Clay created the American system, which was this very, very strategically smart um, uh, industrial strategy, America has exponential industrial growth. Forget the fact that America had huge resources and they were actually you know, taking resources in the West, taking them from other people. Um, but... It's also, there was literally just an industrial, economic, and even tax strategy that was based around building American markets. It's really quite amazing. That's quite cool. I like that you point out the details of elements, what subsidies cause, the incentives that drive people to certain regions, the actual details, not the items that are described, but what caused what. You're actually looking at what caused what, which is a, a great deal there. 
my last question to you is, as far as your book, if you had a message for all a megaphone to the planet, what is something you'd want them to take away from it for their uh, daily thinking or understanding of free markets? I mean, as I keep hammering away, um, well, freedom, first of all, is democracy. I really do believe that. And, and I believe that um, I, mean, I, li I really love democracy and being free. And I think people need to think very, very clearly about what freedom is and, you know, that it's authoritarianism and lacks of and a lack of tolerance will will undermine economic growth again and again we see that we see china by the way i've studied countries over and over again for growth authoritarian countries can have growth it doesn't seem to last more than 70 years over and over again i can't believe china's falling right into what i see in early modern europe i see it in 17th century france um you can see it in uh, German growth, you can see it in other places that have authoritarian governments that come in, so proto, early, early authoritarian governments. So absolutist governments that come in, they have growth, they have these moments of economic um, expansion, but the fact is, is that the, the nature of their government will eventually undermine that growth. I, I actually believe that to be uh, one of the most important things over and over again. Tolerance, democracy, and education. These are the things that seem to work over and over again. And, and the fact is, is that it doesn't work without public education. And that complicates the idea of free markets. So many of the points you're bringing up, I relate to people, people relationships, and the same concepts apply. So it's very valuable to me as well in that context. Professor Solt, I would like to thank you for having joined on this episode and bringing a wealth of knowledge in relation to free markets and related categories. Thank you so much, Arnold. It was a pleasure. Same from my, and we are out.